Hi everyone, JP Blackwell here, MD at ILIS and CEO at Quality Industrial Corp or QIND. So look, just following our shareholders letter, we mentioned that Nick and I would be doing some video podcasts this week. And our plan is to obviously do these, keep these brief and cover specific topics in each one. So again, just to recap, in the letter, we spoke about a plan QI and D uplist, and off of that, the timing of ILIS uplist plans. We spoke about an ILIS share lockup. We spoke about the various subsidiaries under ILIS. And we also spoke about our general outlook and the role that macroeconomics and geopolitics plays and will continue to play in our strategy and I guess the timing of our execution in various areas of the business. So today, I want to talk about QI and D, and Nick will talk about ILIS and the share lockup side of things, I believe. So I urge you to listen to Nick's podcast as well if you're interested in learning more about an ILIS share lockup and more about how ILIS is geared up and planning to continue its growth through you know, what we believe is a global recession uh, that is currently, as I'm sure many of you will have seen, impacting banks, and it's certainly impacting businesses considerably. So as I said, I'll talk about QIND as a business. I'm going to talk about its planned uplist and how all of that progress benefits ILIS. So I want to touch on the ILIS strategy with regards to QIND. I want to link that into ERT, which is the emergency response subsidiary of our business. And then I also plan to do, or I should also just add that I plan to do a separate ERT uh, or more of a public safety focused podcast uh, since, you know, in my opinion, defense is included in the public safety aspect of things. So I want to do a public safety podcast uh, later in the week too um, and focus more around that because I think that's obviously a, a huge, probably the most important side of our business. So, right, enough of that. And again, for those who don't know or are new, let me just say that ILIS owns the majority of Quality Industrial Corp or QIND. So the OTC company, Quality Industrial Corp, ticker QIND, ILIS owns roughly three quarters of QIND. And I guess my point in all of that is that every strong move which QIND makes benefits ILIS and benefits ILIS shareholders. So that was our strategy when we acquired control of QIND, and obviously that now continues, right? So when QIND, for example, just one example is when QIND gets a big order, that is reflected in the ILIS financials. So the PL and the balance sheets of QIND is consolidated by ILIS, and therefore it strengthens ILIS. So that's how conglomerates work. So I'm not by any means saying that ILIS as of right now is a serious global conglomerate, but we're certainly hard, working hard towards becoming one, right? So if QIND itself moves to a big board, such as NASDAQ, as an example, and ILIS remains on the OTC for a period of time, that doesn't matter. We still continue to consolidate uh, QIND's financials. And that's a real positive for ILIS. So if you just stop to think about the possibilities around that, and by that I mean, you know, a QIND uplist to a big board, they're tremendous. In my opinion, they it's huge. And so I urge you to think about what happens to QIND on a bigger board because I can't really state that outright. Uh, but think about its access to capital. Think about its potential balance sheet increase. Think about the size of the deals it can execute. And then think of all of that pulling back to ILIS. So in my opinion, it's a, you know, it's a phenomenal prospect for ILIS. So QIND so far has acquired two acquisitions, or it's closed two acquisitions, should I say, that of Quality International and Petroline. Quality International is obviously the far larger of the two, but Petroline is also very important to us because of its profitability and its ability to scale. We've also mentioned that there is a third acquisition for QIND that's currently in negotiation. It's one with over $100 million in revenue, and it's one that we believe could be agreed on very beneficial terms for QIND and ILIS. But as of right now, and by that I mean the end of, of 2022, QIND delivered in the region of $65 million in revenue. It has over $115 million in assets consolidated, 
and we believe that that should more than double this year. You know, we're forecasting upwards of $140 million in 2023. That's revenue for QI&D in 2023. And that is fairly conservative. If you consider that QI alone had an order book at the end of 2022 of more than $150 million. So I have visible purchase orders sitting on this laptop uh, showing more than $150 million in, in various projects, various orders. And in their first quarter of this year already, they've received more than $40 million in new orders. So, you know, that just about shows how conservative the forecasts are. Uh, but nonetheless, that's that's the forecast we've put out there. Uh, Petroline's annual revenue of roughly $5 million is obviously dwarfed by QI, but it's of particular interest to us. It has a very profitable business model, and that's really what piques our interest. And we've also structured a deal where we obtain dividends quite regularly. So that's obviously very useful to our operations. So also with Petroline, uh, we have plans to build a second oil refinery. Uh, we'd hope to bring that online in 2024, and this would that would quadruple their output. So again, Petroline is very important to us. I don't think many shareholders necessarily see the importance of, of that, but it, it is the second acquisition so far. As I mentioned, there is a third one in negotiations. So we have a clear plan uh, that we are working through. Regarding Quality International, I also just wanted to add, because again, I don't think many are aware that although QI manufactures infrastructure primarily for the oil and gas sector, it also manufactures for the renewables and for the utilities sectors and others. Uh, so what, what does that mean, really? It means that they also manufacture infrastructure such as hydrogen plants, uh, offshore wind turbines, uh, wastewater treatment plants, and that's just really naming a few. But if you think of anything regarding heavy engineering, because uh, they're a heavy engineering and a process manufacturing company, so anything made primarily from steel, from aluminium, from carbon, that you can't build inside a single factory is, is where they specialize. So that's really what heavy engineering and, and process manufacturing is in, in, in simple terms. And the oil and gas industry, believe it or not, is really growing. Um, it's growing as global demand, global oil demand is actually increasing. In, in fact, I believe it's there's, there's plenty of research available on it, and I urge you to look at that. Uh, but I believe it's actually reaching record heights in terms of demand uh, at the moment. So, you know, there is that increased demand for infrastructure as a result of the increasing global oil demand. And of course, coming out of COVID, where a lot of so, you know, similar businesses were shut down or operating at very low levels during that period, certainly from a manufacturing perspective, that's obviously all picking up. And that's why QI, for example, has got such a large order book. That's why it's getting so many new orders uh, on a quarter by quarter basis. So that's all very positive. But there's also an increased demand to build renewable energy infrastructure. So particularly in the likes of Europe, as it looks to reduce its dependency on Russia. And that's just one example. There's plenty of other examples. But in, in short, what QI does is very specialized and it's in very high demand. Uh, and there's also very few companies with the capability, the facilities and the certifications in, in the entire world who can pull off the projects that QI does. So again, the outlook is certainly positive for them. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, you know, all of that's great, but you're likely thinking, well, Nick and JP, you know, you've spoken about uplists for well over a year now. You know, what on earth is happening with that? Why is it taking so long? So just to say, we are working with a well-known investment bank to uplist QIND, and we believe based on the processes, which are primarily filings and the effectiveness of those filings, et cetera, that this uplist should be possible during this summer, summer of 2023. So granted, I know that's quite a wide ranging timescale, but if you look into the processes, you would understand the reasoning around the timing because there's, there's a couple of variables there. Again, as mentioned in our shareholders letter, and again, if you've not re yet read that shareholders letter, the latest one, I urge you to do so. Uh, we don't believe now is the optimal time to work on an ILA sublist. Although, while it may be possible, we don't believe it would necessarily be successful or sustainable, uh, certainly successful. 
you know, the list of companies that have IPO'd on NASDAQ in the last year and are getting booted off, or probably will get booted off soon, is, is actually quite endless. Um, or they've uplisted only to see their share prices get smashed back down to almost penny stock levels. And there's, there's plenty of examples that you can look up. So if you know us by now, you'll know that we certainly don't bow to pressure. And we certainly won't just make a move to satisfy short-term desires of the markets. You know, when the time is right for Eilis, it will do what it needs to do. And as I mentioned, in the meantime, Eilis gets huge benefit from the moves made by QYND. And who is to say that ERT, for example, following a large acquisition, can't also uplist in the medium term? The key for us as a company is growth and sustainability. We cannot repeat that enough um, because regardless of which board Eilis and its subsidiary trains on, uh, trades on, you know, growth and sustainability is our focus. So please keep that in mind uh, as, as you continue to follow us along this journey. And I think we've made that very clear. And I think, you know, the proof is in the pudding. We've continued to, to operate that way and we'll continue to do so. So again, regarding QIND, we believe it's ready for an uplisting and we're following the processes that we need to go through for that. It has the revenue and it has the assets, as mentioned earlier. And while the macroeconomic conditions are currently not conducive, as we've said, for a successful uplist of ILIS itself in the short term, this is certainly not for the case, in our opinion, for QIND. So to quote what was said in the, in the shareholders' letter, QIND operates in a high demand, high growth sector and has the revenue and assets to support itself, he has the key, sustainably on a big board and grow into a global industrial multinational. So things, for example, like geopolitical instability in Europe, energy prices, environmental pressures, strong economic growth in the Middle East and the East, coupled with weaponization of the US dollar, and more also to support the reasoning behind a QIND uplist in this current period. So for those of you who aren't aware of weaponization of the US dollar, I urge you to do some research on it as it's things like this, which many shareholders aren't necessarily aware of that impacts on our decision-making and our strategy almost on a daily basis. So we have to be prepared 10 steps in advance as a business. And there are a number of factors going on in the world which impact our, our decision-making and we're making you know, our decisions in advance. So again, we believe the time is right uh, for QIND and we're working through those processes. So Again, also as mentioned in the letter, QIND meets almost all of, of the criteria for an uplist. With regard, but with regards to its share price, it has a very small float. Again, refer to the letter; it's probably stated more clearly than I'm stating it now. But we've been looking at all the options in this regard. So, one of the options we've we've really honed in on is that of a share a share buyback to meet the criteria in this area. So. You know, just, just keep an eye on us in, in that regard, because that is, is one of the options that we are seriously considering and would look to roll out uh, subject to approval by the investment bank that we're working with. In terms of coming back to an uplisting of QIND and how that would benefit Eilis shareholders, well, with Eilis, again, as I said, owning a large majority of, of a company which has a roughly $300 million valuation, you know, thereabouts. Uh, to us as management, that really just shows how undervalued the current market cap of Eilis is. You know, an uplisting of QIND would serve to rubber stamp uh, this valuation, and that should lead to an increase in the Eilis balance sheet. So, you know, Eilis is planning more than one uplist in 2023 and 2024. So the first one is momentous. Yes, it is. However, its success obviously drives the credibility and the momentum for Eilis in so many areas, including when negotiating large deals. And I'll, I'll touch on that a bit more shortly. But the credibility of the first uplist is very, very important. And so, of course, we've chosen to do QIND first because, as we've mentioned, it's the one which we believe will be the most successful and sustainable in the current period. And, of course, then that, that then serves to Know, give us that momentum going into the latter part of 2023 and into 2024 for further uplists. 
And so that brings me to ERT, because I know many people will say, well, why the shift to an industrial subsidiary when we got into this thing as shareholders because of the technology that saves lives and, and things like that? And, and I must admit, that I can agree uh, you know, with, with that thinking. I myself am in this business because of the public safety components of it. And that's why I'm here. And again, you know, I'm sure many of you are too. So my thoughts are because, I mean, this is as important to me as it is to you. Firstly, we have continued to grow as a company. In fact, we've grown probably far more than even we anticipated as a company. And as we've grown, new opportunities for greater growth have, have impacted our vision. And, and that's primarily you know, one of our key focus areas is to transfer, transform businesses with huge potential and turn them around. So whether it's doubling the revenue and profitability of bullhead products, for example, going from, you know, one to two, one to two million or doing the same with Quality International going from 100 to 200 million. Transformation is our focus. It's it's what Nick and I love about businesses and, and it's what we're pretty darn good at, too. So our vision has grown to include that of building a global conglomerate. As I said, new opportunities present themselves along the way. And, and we've we've tended to go after the, op the opportunities which we have felt would benefit the long-term picture of the business, the long-term performance of the business most. And, and so in terms of building a global conglomerate, an industrial group of companies alongside public safety companies, including defense, renewables companies, and possibly more in the future, all of that is obviously very important um, because it's all, you know, there's more possibilities and they're all key to that conglomerate strategy of, of ours. So if you like one area of the business, of course, you will focus on that. But we are focused on each and every single area of the business. And that brings me to my point regarding ERT, that the growth and success of the other subsidiaries, such as QIND in this instance, is critical to the growth and success of ERT because of ERT, We've taken more of a bow and arrow approach, if I can use that analogy. We initially looked at several smaller companies to acquire and deliver our, our vision. I'm sure you'll recall when we were working through all of that. But we've also learned that larger companies can be acquired more efficiently and more cost effectively, very important that, and deals can be structured for large acquisitions, which are far more suitable. So again, I could go, and I probably will go into more detail on this in the, in the ERT podcast, but the time taken for a small acquisition can be just as long, and in some cases, even more painstaking than that of a large acquisition. So the large acquisition then gives you what you need in terms of manufacturing capability, routes to markets, technical expertise, and so much more that you would gain from even you know 10 smaller acquisitions, for example. But what do you need to accomplish large acquisitions? Well, one thing that's very important, and I know that there are many things, but one thing that's very important is credibility. Credibility goes a long way when you're negotiating a large acquisition. So when you have completed large deals, regardless of the sector that you've completed them in, and you have the audited financials to back you up, again, regardless of which sectors the revenue is derived from, you take your seat then at the negotiation table with an element of credibility, right? So I can take my seat to negotiate a, a large deal with a large fire safety company or fire fighting vehicle manufacturer, for example, with an, with an element of significant credibility behind me when I'm negotiating that deal. And so that allows me to get through the door and our team to get through the door and negotiate the best possible deal. So our view regarding the industrial subsidiary is that it has benefited our ability to execute on the ERT side of the business. That was really the strategy behind it. And it's doing that for us in a big way. So again, as I said, I'll talk more about that in another podcast, but behind the scenes regarding ERT e e e e and using that bow and, and arrow analogy I mentioned, we've been pulling back that bow that bowstring and that tension is building. And when various things align, we'll release the arrow and ERT will ramp up. So we've been getting everything geared up. And as I mentioned in line with that, we are negotiating a pretty large acquisition in the US. I mentioned that in the, in the shareholders letter. So if successful, that would add roughly $65 million in annual revenue to ERT. Uh, the company has an order book of nearly $150 million. It's a US company, as I mentioned. It also gives us extensive manufacturing capability, and this is most important, uh, for Firebug in the US and, and much, much more. So 
Look, there are other deals. We don't, of course, put all of our eggs in one basket. Uh, there's also that wildfire acquisition that is lined up, and that's very important from a strategic perspective, other than it being a great and and you know ridiculously fast growing company. Uh, there are other deals that we're looking at, but really we're working hard. I just wanted to to you know assert that we are working hard within each of the businesses. And as I said, I'll touch more on that in a se- in a separate public safety focused podcast. So I think that more or less brings me to the end. To summarize, we're pushing forward with the uplisting of QIND. That is really, I guess, the most important important punchline of this message, if I can say that. Uh, I believe it's very exciting for both ILIS and for QIND shareholders. Uh, you know, as per the many reasons I've mentioned uh, earlier. I'm sure that there are plenty more too, but uh, I've tried to give you a snapshot. Uh, there's obviously so much more I could say, but I wanted to keep this brief. Hopefully you're aware that as each ILIS subsidiary goes from strength to strength, ILIS benefits. So hopefully I've also made that strategy around the acquisitions and ERT and all of that a, a bit clearer for you. you know, our reason behind things, the way we're doing things, why we're trying to do things a certain way. Again, there's far more to it, but hopefully that just gives you, you know, a, a bit of a snapshot of it all. I also, you know, I well realize that many want news on demand, especially with the way things are going in the markets. And to a large extent, what we're doing with QIND is very important news for ILIS and QIND shareholders. But with that said, you know, things do also take as long as they take in current market conditions. We forecasted an uplist. We are delivering that, although it is taking longer than we originally planned in many respects. But we also didn't forecast a global recession, certainly to the extent that it is impacting the markets and will likely continue to do so. So that is why things do take as long as they take. And as is very clear, we are pushing forward. And we have been for some time. We've made great strides uh, with with regards to an uplist. And I I think it is is very exciting uh, with with what's coming, certainly as we've said during the summer of, of this year. But regardless, of all of that, you know, I, I believe we've achieved phenomenal growth in 2023. I can't harp on about that enough. Uh, we've built a business that can still potentially agree, achieve great things during a recession, even during a recession, including an uplist. And I don't think that there's many real revenue generating businesses out there that have grown as quickly as us or are doing things much quicker, really. You know, every real business right now real business is evaluating its strategy and ensuring that it's prepared for some pretty tough times. You know, it's battening down the hatches, ensuring efficiency and things like that. So I get that there's a lot of exciting things out there. I mean, I myself know the markets very, very well, but I also question the sustainability of a lot of these things. You know, when you run a company and you're in the thick of it, it's very easy to see where there is a lot of hype and there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of talk and possibly not a whole lot of follow through. And I, for one, certainly think that we've positioned ourselves very well as we enter into a recession. We arguably are already in it. And um, I think that we'll continue to go from strength to strength. And there's certainly a number of things that we can deliver during the course of this year and next, which I think because of the way we've built the company uh, will allow us to continue to grow when others will potentially fail. That's really that's really the sum of it. Again, this was meant to be a summary, so let me just say look out for Nick's video podcast, uh, and there will be more during the course of this week. So for now, thanks for listening. I hope it clarifies some things in your mind. And until the next one, goodbye.